everyone. Welcome to the jungle. Alrighty. Welcome to the show. May 1st. Well, it will be in two days. We're so recording a little bit early, but... Is that the... May 1st is when the show will come out. Do I get to tell everybody what May 1st is? No. Especially not based on the thing I just told you. <laughs> <laughs> Shh. All right. It's an important day in Jerry's life, but it's an we'll important just leave day. it at that. Leave it at that. All right. Uh, yeah. Crazy. May. Uh... Five months into the year, uh, oh a month into the second quarter. That's going to be significant here in a second when we talk about a couple of things. So if you were watching, question for you at the beginning of the show. <clears throat> if you were watching the financial media this week. And I do. Of course. Bloomberg, all that in the back. <laughs> I got it on the TV also. <clears throat> what do you think was the biggest event of the week? Did uh, did Elon buy Tesla this week? I mean, uh, Tesla. No, Twitter? Twitter. Was that this week? I think that was last week. Oh, yeah. Then I, I must have missed it. Well, there's a couple things. Uh, it was a big earnings week. Mm-hmm. That was pretty huge, right? A lot of high-tech I think companies. I may look at different things than you, Lou. Quite possibly. <laughs> I see I see Bloomberg in a different way. <laughs> so, we have but, different lenses. <clears throat> a lot of stuff about earnings, right? Apple, Amazon, Facebook, a whole bunch of other tech companies had earnings come out. Uh, Amazon was down... I mean, we're a little bit before the close on Friday as we're recording this, right? Amazon was down like 15, 16%, something like that, the last time I looked mm-hmm. today. That's pretty big. Um, Facebook, on Thursday, before the open, so I guess, I think earnings came out on Wednesday after the close, but Facebook on Thursday was up 17%. That was huge. Now, Facebook had been clobbered. Um, meta. Meta, sorry. Meta had been absolutely clobbered over the past couple of months, but jumped 17% on Thursday, and that led to this huge one-day relief rally uh, for the market, right? A lot of coverage about that. There was one piece of news that came out on Thursday morning after Facebook's (coughs) earnings, um, but before the open, and I thought it would have gotten a lot more coverage than it did. What's that? Talk to me. So we got the GDP numbers for last quarter, mm-hmm. and they were a surprise negative 1.4%. Right. So there was a bunch of talk about that on Bloomberg Radio uh, in the morning before the open on Thursday, but then it kind of got overshadowed by Facebook and, and this big jump. But as you recall, we, I was talking about it last week or the week before or whatever, a recession is defined as two consecutive negative uh, GDP quarters. Mm-hmm. We just had the first negative GDP quarter. Mm-hmm. So it's very possible that come July, the government's going to come back and say, yep, we're in a recession and we've been in it since January. All right. Newsflash. Newsflash. Yeah, <laughs> but nobody else wants to flash it. For, school. <laughs> for whatever reason, let's talk about Facebook uh, meta, um, yeah. which is off even after that 17% move higher. It's still like 50% off its high. Um, and I don't know what is, I'm sure it's down today. I didn't even actually look at it today, but, uh, yeah, today's a rough, a rough day for the market. I, I put the slideshow together, the last couple of charts at, uh, around two thirty, And so when we, when we get to the weekly charts, we'll look at it. But, uh, it was a very rough week to, to be a very volatile week and finished on a down note for sure. All right. Okay. thought this one was pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty comical. Um, Obviously, it's been quite the roller coaster ride. I've been riding for this us, one right? for years. Yeah, so you got old dude telling his kid, I, "I don't want any any part of this thing," right? And the kid's looking at it like, "Ooh, risk. That means I can make money, right?" Yeah, right. Um, and I kind of got me thinking, like, it, there's a lot of people out there in TSP land um, that are, you know, looking at going into retirement and looking at this roller coaster, going, "Oh no, no, no! <laughs> I've seen this game before. I'm not playing it." Uh, and then there are some young guys that are like, uh, ah, oh, let's go. Don't worry about market it. market always goes up. and don't, don't worry about that. It's just two completely different ways to look at the world. It usually is. Yeah. Okay. So the the focus of the week um, that we put out on, on different posts on Facebook and stuff has has been uh, ESGs. So that's going to be the, the focus of the show. Uh, I was hoping to have some more updates on the mutual fund window. Unfortunately... Either they haven't sorted out what they're going to do yet, or they're keeping it a secret. Uh, 
Jerry even cold called the, I did. the thrift. I, I called the thrift line. I called the Federal Thrift Retirement Board. Yeah. Um, that's the one I thought was funny. Are yeah, you going to yeah, go yeah. knock on the door next week? Uh, pretty much. Yeah. If I get <laughs> down like, to hey. K Street, I'm going to. Yeah. Um, I called the thrift line. The woman was very nice, and we, yeah. we chit-chatted a little bit, and I did the best I could kinda, to try to. She wasn't giving up much. Uh, she did say that we're not going to get a look in the window until everything comes back online. So not what I wanted to hear, but it was some pretty good guys wow. anyway. Like we have yeah. to wait, not not even just as they go down. We got to wait till it comes back up, right? Jeez, right. And and there's no guarantee that as soon as you know TSP.gov comes back online, that the mutual fund window is going to be open immediately, right? right? Yeah, that's yeah, that's what a lot of people are thinking, and they're not really saying any of that. All yeah. they're saying is we're shutting it down on this date. Yep. Somewhere in here, we're going to bring it back, and we yep. don't tell you what's going to happen then. Right. That's it's just straight up. You know, yeah, sketchy. It's sketchy, it's right? Sketch, man. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, when I called the, the thrift uh, investment board, I got uh, it didn't ring. I did it a bunch of times, right? And I had to make sure my phone worked, make sure I didn't have any IT hiccups on my phone, <laughs> reboot my phone. Uh, but it 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 didn't ring, and it just said, uh, "Your call cannot be completed this time. Try again later." <laughs> yeah. That's like so, calling an undisclosed location. Yeah, you're not getting in, right? Um, this is not the droid you're looking for. <laughs> So once the window does open, uh, we know there's going to be a lot of a big advertising blitz, right? That's going to try to kind of yeah. push us. If you want to be in the mutual fund window, we think you should be in ESGs. And so that's why we're taking another look at ESGs. Um, so I tried to put this presentation together uh, kind of in a fair and balanced, non-political way. Okay. There, there are definitely strong feelings on both sides of the fence. Uh, and I just wanted to kind of get the facts out there so you guys can make informed and unbiased decisions. Um, I got info from several different sites and reports, and of course I have a chart at the end of this piece that um, tells the most important story about ESGs, and that, of course... Of course you have a chart. ...is price. Price. We can talk, water cooler talk about, ah, I would never do ESGs, or oh, ESGs are great, or whatever. But at the end of the day, price. It's all about price. Yeah. Price is right. Let's hope so. So what are ESGs? Uh, environmental, social, and governance funds. Um, they are portfolios of equities and or bonds, which in our case, they're going to be mutual funds, uh, which environmental, social, and governance factors have been integrated into the investment process. So we will buy a fund. If you, if you buy an ESG fund in the window, it will, be, it will include... Equities, stocks, and or bonds that uh, the companies uh, have gone through this uh, process. Um, so means that the, the equities and bonds contained in the fund have, have passed stringent tests over how sustainable the company or government is regarding its ESG criteria. <laughs> so... Certainly in the past few years, we've seen uh, a big increase of interest in investing based on environmental, social, governance factors, right? Lured by the promise of doing well by doing good. Investors poured billions of dollars into ESG strategies, turning the acronym into one of Wall Street's favorite buzzwords. So here's, this is from a, a Barron's article that I think I put up on Facebook the other day. So what I, my biggest takeaway from this slide um, as the approach soared in popularity, investment companies, large and small, seized the opportunity to design and market new ESG funds and ratings. Professionally, professionally managed assets with ESG mandates swelled to $46 trillion globally in 2021. Okay, so $46 trillion in 2021. It was 40% of all assets under management. And Deloitte thinks that by 2024, that figure is going to be 80 trillion half more than half of all professionally managed assets are going to be ESGs I don't well what that what that means to me is that uh, if you if you if you we talk about ESGs right it's a uh, um, you would think it's like green energy and and you know I, you could argue Tesla is a tech company or it's in, or it's a sort of a green company right because it's, it's it, obviously you don't have any gas right um, I saw a funny meme, though, by the way, yesterday, where somebody was saying, like, because he just spent, was it $44 billion on Twitter? Yeah. And he and somebody was like, 
you know, he could have spent that $44 billion, like, you know, doing something clean for the planet. Yeah. And this yeah. other guy was like, like, make cars electric. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Like, right. I think he does. I think he could check that Dude, block. There's so much stuff, <laughs> right? I mean, you've, cause you've gone, I'm sure the next step, right? And, and supposedly it takes more energy to build the batteries than it does. <laughs> I mean, it just goes on it's and spiral, on. It's oh. spiral. Jeez. Sorry to get us off course. Go yeah. ahead. Well, no, <laughs> it, ac- it actually goes to the point. Cause you would, I think anybody would sort of intuitively say, yeah, Tesla is probably falls into the ESG category. Mm-hmm. Um, Really, what this is about is the, the the sanctioning, the rules, and as long as you can fit your portfolio your or your thing, company, yeah, your yeah, thing, yeah. in in you get the check mark from the government that says you're ESG, you're ESG compliant, yeah. right? Because obviously, if fifty percent, if more than half um, of of professional managers' assets are going to be in ESGs, like it's not about the reality it's about the block that's being checked it's it's insane so anyway um as you might expect russia's and in, russia's invasion of the ukraine uh kind of gave the first test to esgs right because by eschewing traditional energy stocks and defense shares which are having a banner year in 2022 and embracing low carbon footprint technology stocks which aren't having a very good year uh Many ESG funds lost money in the first quarter and underperformed their benchmarks. We're going to take a look at that on the chart. An ESG investment product should contain only those securities with a high sustainability score and would ex- exclude companies with, for example, poor records on pollution, bad labor relations, right, that people don't like each other, and or bad management practices. Um, how they put a, a score on that, I have the slightest idea. It would also exclude uh, sovereign bonds of governments with similarly poor records. We are digging ourselves, we're put, pigeonholing ourselves into something that's just unsustainable, I think, no pun intended. But research has shown that the use of ESGs in security selection leads to better informed investment decisions, and that sustainability funds can, can perform better than non-sustainable ones, partly because of better risk management over uh, conscientious issues. Okay, I'll, I'll buy into that a little bit. Companies with a lower carbon footprint, for example, would face lower regulatory or social risk than a polluting company, right? And so its shares should be less volatile over time. Okay, I'll, I'll sort of buy that. Right? Makes sense. Yeah. If you're, if you're focused more on things that... Um, will help you get more benefits from the government, let's say, then the shares of your company should reflect that and go higher, right? It's all in there, Mm -hmm. you know, not direct, but it's in there. So the link between ESG and performance, because that's at the end of the day what we want to know. Why would ESGs perform better or worse? So this company, Robeco, here's the link, uh, has long believed in the benefits of sustainability investing, we're convinced that using financially material environmental, social, and governance uh, information in our decision process leads to better informed investment decisions and a better risk-adjusted return in the long run. Interesting. This belief is supported by a growing body of evidence. Uh, a good example of a meta-study on the relationship between ESG and performance was in uh, this paper they did in 2015. Um paper examines more than 200 sources, including research and books and newspapers, and concluded that 80% of the reviewed studies demonstrate that prudent sustainability practices have a positive influence on investment performance. Okay. So if 80% of the reviewed studies demonstrate that uh, prudent sustainability practices have a positive influence on investment performance, that's, that's definitely a plus for ESGs, right, for sure. A separate survey later uh, by Deutsche Bank um, goes even further. Research looked at the entire universe of 2,250 academic studies published on the subject since 1970, um, spanning four decades until 2014. It concludes that ESGs made a positive contribution to corporate financial performance in 62.6% of studies and produced negative results in only 10% of cases. So okay, this is some factual. It's not. It's not a. It's not an opinion piece, right? It's it's factual. So, um, 
So those are some positives. So why are some people still skeptical? Um, unfortunately, some of the negative studies are the ones that tend to be best known by the general public, right? Um, such as the, uh, as those on so-called sin stocks. While currently, uh, while current discussions still focus predominantly on whether sustainability actually adds value. Uh, so why do people's perceptions of the benefits of sustainability investing differ so widely? So one of the reasons is that the concept of sustainable investing is very broad. We've identified three different objectives for doing so. First, some investors simply wish to avoid certain companies because their business activities do not match their beliefs. That's probably the biggest thing uh, that we hear about the most, right? If you don't want to, uh, if you don't want your retirement dollars going toward big oil or tobacco or guns or whatever, this is your, you can invest in things that more match your beliefs. Much of the early academic work, including a paper on sin stocks by Princeton University, focused on these value-based exclusion policies. Okay, so second, some investors want to create a positive impact by allocating capital to specific companies or sectors that offer solutions to global issues. Nothing wrong with that. Although it makes sense to invest in companies that play into specific sustainability trends, financial motives can vary uh, or differ per investor. Sometimes the main driver is the desire to have a more positive impact on society. Okay, a lot of people want to do that with their money. Nothing wrong with that. Third, investors increasingly want to exploit the growing amount of data and knowledge on sustainable business models as a way to improve their financial returns. That kind of goes more to what we were talking about before. So all those certainly are reasons to invest in ESGs if you want to. So what are the factors that get um, taken into consideration? So if it's an environmental, uh, it's conservation, right? Climate change, uh, air and water pollution, biodiversity, deforestation, you know, water and food scarcity, all that. If it's social, it's consideration for people and relationships. So uh, customer satisfaction, I thought that was kind of comical, but uh, gender diversity, employment engagement, community relations, human rights, labor standards, those kinds of things. Governance uh, stands for how the, the company is run, right? Um, diversity on the board, uh, how, how the company is audited, is it corrupt? Um, lobbying, is it a lobbying company at all? <laughs> Political contributions, whistleblower schemes. So uh, all these things get taken into consideration whether or not you get the check mark that says you are compliant and you can call yourself an ESG fund or, or an ESG compliant company. All right, so for us, what are the best ESGs? Um, I'm trying to get rid of this. Eraser. It got stuck either. Stick it. So before I go on to this thing, I want to go back to. Um, there you go. It went away. Did it? You got it. Okay, good. Okay. I can't usually solve those problems so simply, as you know. <laughs> All right. So the best ESGs. Here's a. Uh, <laughs> is your eraser not working? I don't know, bro. Uh, here's a, this is a Forbes article, Forbes advisor, um, the best ESG funds as of April, 2022. So a couple things to look at, um, the C fund. So we're talking about expense ratio. That's one of the big buzzwords that people are concerned about. So in, in the mutual fund window, as well as the, the assortment of fees that you have to pay to pay to play basically in the mutual fund window, um, the funds that you buy will also have some kind of expense ratio, which is the um, kind of the, the, uh, the, the fees that you're, you're spending per thousand dollars that you invest. So the C fund expense ratio is 0 0.042. So that's 42 cents for every thousand dollars you have invested in the C fund uh, comes out in fees. Okay. 42 cents for every thousand dollars. So, uh, in the case of v VFTAX, right, the top, what, what Forbes is saying is their number one pick for ESGs as of April, that's uh, $1.40 in fees per $1,000 invested. If you're looking at their number two, it's $2.50 per $1,000 invested. So the fees get to be uh, pretty substantial with these funds. 
But these are the first two. Um, again, you can get the, the link at right here at, at Forbes. Um, and here are the last of the seven. So this is kind of interesting, the methodology, right? We began by looking at approximately 80 ETFs and mutual funds focused on ESG investing. While some investors are willing to sacrifice returns in exchange for ESG-focused investments, we were not. We excluded funds that did not have at least three years of performance data. We also excluded funds whose performance fell significantly below the benchmark S&P 500 index or other ESG funds. So of the total that they looked at, the 80, they excluded funds that, that significantly fell below the benchmark. And we looked at the top seven of the 80, okay? So here's a chart. VFTAX is, the, is their number one pick, okay? So here's the price chart of, of that ETF. So Vanguard, um, the Vanguard FTSE Social Index Fund tracks the FTSE for Good U.S. Select Index. <laughs> um, the index excludes companies dealing with what it calls vice products, adult entertainment, alcohol, gambling, tobacco, uh, non-renewable energy, right? So nuclear power, fossil fuels, and weapons. Uh, the index also excludes companies based on, quote, controversial conduct and diversity practices. So VFTAX has one of the lowest expense ratios on our list at just 14 basis points with a minimum investment of $3,000. It's also one of the best performing. Its top five holdings are Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, and Alphabet Class A and Class B. So <laughs> it excludes, um, it's excluding oil, which, so it has no... Um, Exposure to oil, which oil has, has gone through the roof, and if it doesn't have any exposure to oil, and the S&P 500 does have exposure to oil, that's a big reason why the relative strength uh, line is coming down. So the top part of the chart is the price, right? Three-year weekly chart of VFTAX. The bottom is VFTAX versus the S&P 500, right? It's a ratio chart. So... When this line is, is increasing, it means VFTAX is outperforming the S&P 500. Okay? When this line is decreasing, it's underperforming the S&P 500. So on a three-year weekly chart, uh, you get 2019, 2020, and 2021, the, their number one, Forbes' number one fund, certainly... Uh, outperformed the S&P 500, outperformed the C fund. Does it outperform it enough to overcome the fees that are associated with it? I don't know. It's a lot more math than I wanted to do uh, with this chart. But in general, over the last three years, at least 19, 20, 21, uh, that ESG beat the C fund. In 22, not so much. So their number one ESG through April 2022, is definitely underperforming the C fund. I mean, if the this is the price chart, right? So it's it's coming down, um, and it's under it's underperforming the C fund. And we know the C fund is 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 off uh, almost 15 percent. So VFTAX is off, you know, more than the C fund, and that's their best fund. So, but again, the three years prior, it it beat the C fund. So, for what it's worth, just some, some good info on thoughts about ESGs and whether or not you want to get into it when the mutual fund window opens up. Okay, the TSP fund charts. All right, so like we said, we put this together uh, about 2.30 on Friday afternoon, so it's not complete for the week, but it doesn't really matter. Nothing's going to change very much. Um, the C fund's going to be down over 2% for the week. We've been talking about the importance of the 20-week exponential moving average line. 
which is this blue line. Every time we hit it, once we got, here was the COVID low. Every time we hit it for support, we kept going on to new highs until January of this year. And we haven't been able to get back above it. We were above it here for two weeks back in March and then rolled over and have been below it now and have had uh, one, two, three, four consecutive negative weeks. And you can see basically just by eyeballing it that this is 4,200. Uh, that support line is pretty critical and it does not look like it's going to hold to me. And we got RSI well below 50 and continuing to decline. No reason to be in the C fund at this point. S fund, same kind of thing. Um, the only sort of, it's not a positive, it's just uh, an observation. We're a lot closer to getting oversold in terms of RSI uh, on the S fund than we were on the C fund. But that 1800 support level is is probably going to be broken by the end of the, the week, by the end of Friday. So when we look at it, unless we get a recovery in the last hour of trading, um, we've, we've broken that 1800 support level. So no reason to be in the S fund. I fund, same kind of thing. Had a had a much bigger relative rally in the I fund back here in March, um, but then we had one, two, three, four consecutive down weeks, well below the twenty week moving average line. RSI is not oversold yet, and well below fifty, so no reason to be in the I fund. F fund still collapsing. Looked like it was gonna turn around a little bit this week, but then reversed. It did at some point. It got above one hundred four at some point during the week, and reversed. And as of 2.30 on Friday, it was back down here just barely above 103. So no no reason to be in the F fund right now other than uh, you sh I, I would be watching the F fund pretty closely for some kind of snapback because uh, it's, it's way, way overextended to the downside. Um, there's still a lot of reasons not to be in the F fund, but if you were going to try to catch a falling knife, this is a pretty good one to try to catch, um, especially if we tick back up here, relative strength ticks back up above 30. Um, anyway, that is about it. What a cow. You caught me off guard. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't ready for questions. Questions. <laughs> Man, I... Yeah, there's just so many unknowns back to this whole mutual fund window and then mm -hmm. taking the TSP down. And Jerry and I were kind of pontificating last night. And, uh, I mean, there's just – it's amazing to me. I know, uh, you know, kind of as a tech guy, I know I – I, I, I get it. I have respect for what it takes to take down this huge oh, yeah. piece of technology. Oh. It's not just a website, right? right. There's so much going on there, right? And so I get it, right? And the fact that they're going to pull it off in like a week or two is probably amazing, yeah. right? Over over Memorial Day weekend. I mean, I but, guess everybody's going to be working. <laughs> but it's our retirement accounts, and we can't touch them for two weeks. And the fact that that's okay, it's just so weird to me. Yeah, I can't get I can't uh, I can't get wrap my head around. Okay, well we're only going to leave like the phone lines open, and they'll do manually. Or yeah. could you imagine us like in our old job being like? We're just going to shut down for two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> and, you no. know. <laughs> just not show up? It's yeah. Not, no. It's not, no. It's not a thing. Anyway, um, yeah. it, it, you know, this too shall pass. We'll, we'll, yeah. get, we'll get past it. We'll, it'll be something uh, cool to talk about for a few months. Uh, yep. You know, yep. or what have there's you. Gonna be a, yeah, there's going to be a lot to, to talk about. Actually, we're doing the, um, the public webinar on Tuesday, right? That's going to be on um, the tech refresh. Right. Yeah, we're going to be talking about, uh, digging into this a lot, yep. right, about the whole tech refresh, mutual phone window, the, the whole thing. Yep. Um, yeah, if you haven't been catching Jerry, Jerry's been uh, popping in live on Wednesdays in our public Facebook group. Yep. Uh, two o'clock on Eastern Time? Two yeah, so he pops in there live, does a little talk, and takes some Q&A. And then also, uh, he's putting together a webinar every month. Uh, first Tuesday of every month? Yeah. Yes. First Tuesday of every month. Uh, easiest way to find out about it is go into our public Facebook group. It's pinned to the top. 
and you can register there. Uh, it should be pretty cool. I mean, we're Jerry's taking time out to uh, basically just talk to anybody <laughs> who wants to come and, and chat about it. And here's the cool thing is if you sign up for one uh, of those webinars, you sign up for all of them. So if you want to watch them, you don't have to register every time. Yep. So we set that up so it made it a little simpler for everybody. Uh, if you like it, uh, share it with your friends. If you like this show, share it with your friends. Wherever you find this video, uh, you know, shoot us a shout out. Uh, give us a comment, a question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if it's on YouTube or Facebook or MySpace or Twitters. MySpace, that's still right. I don't think we're on Twitter. <laughs> All right, man. You guys have a great week, and we will yep. see you soon. All right. And out of here. Out of here.